Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Ethics and Research in Biotechnology Consortia Series. I am your host, In Su Hien. I am Director of Research Ethics and a faculty member in the Center for Bioethics at uh, Harvard Medical School, and I'm also a professor of bioethics at Case Western Reserve University. The goal of this um, speaker series is to expose bioethicists to some of the most important scientific research that is happening today, research that many of you may not have actually heard of. And thus, it's my honor to present to you uh, Dr. Joseph Penninger. Um, and uh, before I do my introductions, I do want to just do a little bit of housekeeping. The, uh, the Q&A box at the bottom of the uh, screen is there for you along the way to pose your questions, which we'll get to in the discussion portion of the session. So uh, please enter your questions there. If any problems arise, you can use the chat function to speak to any one of us. Um, so thank you for joining us. I forgot to give that a little bit earlier. So getting back to the introduction for today, Dr. Joseph, Joseph Penninger is an Austrian biomedical researcher who specializes in molecular immunology. Now, I don't think I've ever met somebody who has this many titles, but let me just go through some of his titles. He is the director of the Life Sciences Institute and professor in the Department of Medical Genetics in the University of British Columbia. He is professor of genetics at the University of Vienna, and he is full professor in the Department of Immunology at the University of Toronto. But among his titles, I think my favorite one is the informal title he has. It's the nickname Mr. ACE2. Now, broadly speaking, Dr. Penninger works to develop new treatments for diseases by uncovering the fundamental biological principles that underlie development and disease. Now, to accomplish these goals, he develops and he deploys a broad range of in vitro and in vivo tools that reveal the fundamental mechanisms involved in human disease. Now, most notably for decades, he has been doing groundbreaking work on the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or ACE2 for short. And in recent years, he's even developed a soluble version of ACE2 for acute lung injury. So today he's with us to explain what we can learn from the ACE2 cellular receptor, what we have learned in the past, what we are learning at present, and what we could learn in the future. So with that, I want to turn it over now to our speaker, Joseph. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much for, for having me and for this invitation. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the, the ride we have been uh, having the, for the last years to actually study uh, ACE2. And uh, so I, take, I want to take you from the discovery to, of course, to the COVID-19 pandemic and, and how this all came together and, and what we believe could be a possible solution for universal therapeutics. Uh, of course, for this ethics seminar, it's, it might be of relevance. There's the fourth wave now in Europe. So I'm Austrian, I work now in, in Vancouver in Canada. Uh, yesterday, there were 15,000 new cases in Austria, uh, uh, diagnosed cases for COVID-19, for better for the virus, being infected with the virus. Uh, for a population of 8 million people, so that's quite significant. And today, actually, the government announced uh, the fourth lockdown starting on Monday. And uh, the other thing, and maybe we discuss this later, a compulsory vaccination. So as far as I know, that's actually the, the first country which uh, mandates, legally mandates compulsory vaccination for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, <clears throat> so before I start to, uh, having lived in, in Vienna and coming from, from Austria, of course, I have to always start with some paintings. Uh, and one of the great painters of the 20th century was Oskar Kokoschka. And when Kokoschka was a young unknown painter, you only had to pay the painting if you actually liked it. So when he painted Auguste Forel, uh, the family gave the painting back to Kokoschka. And so Kokoschka was quite disappointed and then of course asked, so why don't you like this painting? I think it's actually a great painting. And they said, well, he doesn't really look like him because Kokoschka painted him with, a, as you can see here, with a hand hanging down, one of the eyelids uh, hanging down. So Kokoschka painted Auguste Forel having a stroke. 
uh, which he actually didn't have. However, around a year later, he exactly had this stroke. So now we would call it a, a ischemic transient, uh, a transient ischemic episode. So, so to to anticipate what might ha happen in the future. <clears throat> but of course, this is for me what biomedical research should do: uh, use our technologies, the amazing technologies which have been developed in the last years by many people uh, to fundamentally understand physiology, uh, interaction with the environment, and of course, disease uh, at all levels from basic research, from, uh, from translating basic research into, into medicines, uh, uh, working with patients, and of course, uh, in Essex to use this technology for the greater good uh, and, and possibly anticipate what might happen in the future. And through this fundamental understanding and this consensus we all agree to, uh, to come up with, with improving the state of the world. So uh, to start uh, uh, disclosure, so these are the funding agency which give me money and I want, I will show you data from a company I started called the Pyron Biologics. So you can put it uh, in the right context, what they tell you, just to state my uh, potential conflict of interest. Uh, this is my new playground. Uh, this is uh, Vancouver from where I'm actually talking to you. As you might know, we had uh, really bad storm. So Vancouver is actually cut off uh, via land uh, roads from the rest of Canada. So all our supplies are actually coming through the US now, which is interesting. And, and the supermarkets are actually half empty. So beside all this uh, uh, COVID-19, I think we should not forget uh, climate change and the consequences of it. Uh, I'm actually part of European consortium studying infectious diseases because of climate change in Europe and I'm sure many other places on the planet. Uh, there are changed microenvironments which allowed, for instance, particular uh, flies and, 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 and mosquitoes to come into those microenvironments and actually bringing diseases uh, into the communities, diseases we have not seen for hundreds of years. So, so this climate change is not just the water levels might rise and, and an issue of CO2. So this is uh, very strong consequences, how we interact with, with the world. And of course, in a in in world with lots of people living in, in urban spaces, we change climate. So COVID-19 will not have been the, the last uh, a pandemic. So there's probably bound to be many more to come. So the story for me started actually when I was a young investigator in Toronto, working at the University of Toronto. And I was, I'm actually a trained immunologist. So we did some of the first knockout mice and mapping of the immune systems, uh, which then led to cancer immunotherapies. Uh, and, and eventually I got interested in in genes which regulate the development of hearts. Uh, at this time, you know, this was before CRISPR, uh, before we could actually sequence real humans. So we, we were just interested how, if we could find genes which regulate the development of Drosophila, uh, of flies, uh, fruit flies. And here you can see some of the markers we used, Eve and Tinman, and here the mutants. So, and we then realized that actually Drosophila had two copies based on the screen, two copies of a gene which had been known for a long time called angiotensin converting enzyme. So a postdoc in my lab, Mike Krakow, actually works now for a company in Boston, uh, cloned the second copy, which is now called ACE2, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme number two. So it's this dimeric protein, so this is the structure. Uh, and it's evolutionary, highly conserved. So we were involved in a recent study where you can find even an, an orthologous copy of ACE2 in bacteria. 
And this bacterial copy even has uh, enzymatic activity and the enzyme activity has this, this molecule which sticks out of the membrane. So it's a transmembrane protein and has this catalytic domain uh, working as a carboxypeptidate uh, clipping little peptides. So initially it was not really clear what uh, ACE2 was doing and I should give proper credit to my group. Also we had the gene cloned was not the first publishing the sequence of the gene, so this credit goes to others. Uh, but I'm a functional geneticist, so I was always interested um, what's the real function of a gene in, in larger networks and in, in the living organism. And that's, of course, uh, where knockout technologies and living animals came in. So we asked the question, what's actually the essential in vivo function of ACE2? So we created the first mutant animal, mutant knockout mouse using stem cell technologies uh, to study this function. And this is what we saw. This is a, a heart study. This is echocardiography, heartbeats in mice. Uh, this is our slang. So ACE2 plus Y means uh, we actually mapped it to the X chromosome, uh, ACE2, in, in all the species we know, also in human. Uh, this is basically a male mouse, which is normal. <clears throat> and this is a knockout mouse, a male knockout mouse. That's by Y, which is knockout. And as you can see in this particular mouse background, we saw impaired heart function. And when we crossed it to the other mutants, so the first ACE, then we saw total rescue. <clears throat> so basically what... Uh, Mike had discovered is the, is the critical negative regulator of the rain and angiotensin system. To simplify, ACE makes a peptide with eight amino acids, which we call angiotensin 2. And this via two G protein coupled receptors regulate some of the most fundamental physiological processes in our body, blood pressure, uh, heart function. Uh, water sodium reabsorption in the kidney and thereby uh, this system is involved in many many diseases hypertension so millions of people actually receive uh, ACE inhibitors or blockers of the AT1 receptor uh, of fibrotic kidney disease so this is a strong driver of disease and ACE2 turns out to have exactly the opposite function. It actually gets rid of angiotensin 2. So ACE makes angiotensin 2 and ACE2 gets rid of angiotensin 2. And by doing so, these two uh, enzymes keep this, this critical system in our body. So that's the system after my lecture, if you get up from, um, from your chair, that's the reason why you, why you might not faint because it regulates your blood pressure. So, so these two enzymes keep the system uh, in, in balance. <clears throat> then we realized that ACE2 was strongly expressed in the lung and it didn't make any sense. And our animals and mutant animals had normal lung structure, uh, normal lung function. So, <clears throat> so this didn't change normal homeostasis. Uh, and to study this a little further, actually, uh, Yumiko Imai, who is now a professor in, in, in Osaka, in, in Japan, uh, developed probably the first, or one of the first intensive care units for mice. So it took us many years to set up systems where we could basically model uh, acute lung injury in an intensive care uh, setting, more or less, with the idea to dissect the molecular and, and cellular mechanisms which contribute to lung injury. So this was, when we started, this was around 2000, uh, 2001. And when Yumiko plugged in uh, our ACE2 mutant animals into this assay, uh, here on top, this is already severe lung injury, so it's already bleeding into the lung. So we have this non-infectious model for lung injury which we developed, and the ACE2 knockout mice developed very severe disease. So basically what Yumiko discovered is that ACE2 protects from very severe lung failure. The blood vessels get leaky, and this is why you see these blue colors here. <clears throat> so this is where we were, and we were laboring away. And then the first SARS virus came into the world, a coronavirus causing a very severe respiratory disease with around 10% lethality calling, called severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome. 
I worked in Toronto at this time, so I could just moved back to Europe in summer. Toronto was actually the epicenter of the SARS outbreak uh, <clears throat> outside of China. Uh, one of our students got sick, our hospital was quarantined, and it was an interesting experience because at the end, there were only 8,000 people, as far as we know, infected with the SARS coronavirus, around 10% died. But this completely changed uh, economies uh, like Toronto, the film industry broke down, for instance. Uh, we didn't know if you could send your kids to school again, but the, and the outbreak took from October 2002 to July 2003. So it took eight months to control this. Uh, with only 8,000 cases. So the idea that we can really control COVID-19 and this new virus with this hundreds of millions of people infected uh, was from the beginning foolish anyway. Uh, and then this paper came out uh, from Mike Fasan at this time at Harvard, uh, looking for candidate uh, receptors for the SARS coronavirus, for the spike protein. And he came up to the surprise uh, to me, but not totally surprising because other coronaviruses use siblings of ACE2 for infection, that ACE2 could be a candidate receptor for, for the SARS coronavirus infection. However, the question was, is ACE2 actually essential? Because early on, there were many other candidate receptors identified. And so one never knows if this is actually important or it's, it's just another receptor on the cell surface which allows the virus to enter. Since we had the only knockout mouse in the world at this time, we sent our mice to China. Uh, they got infected with the SARS-CoV virus. And in the normal vi mice, wild-type mice, in our slang, uh, we could recover virus in ACE2 knockout mice, we couldn't. So this was the critical experiment to prove that in vivo, in the respiratory in virus setting of SARS-CoV-2 infections. If there's no ACE2, there's no virus infection. So ACE2 is the central in vivo receptor for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And over the years, uh, in multiple papers, we came up with this idea, uh, which is now in textbooks, that basically the SARS coronavirus uses ACE2 uh, to bind as an entry gate for infection. This also leads to ACE2 downregulation. So ACE2 is lost from the cell surface, but ACE2 uh, inactivates this angiotensin II peptide. And there, if there's a trigger of lung injury, an infectious as non-infectious trigger, it drives actually ACE2 and drives more severe disease. So basically the SARS virus became a dangerous virus because it does not just use ACE2 for entry into our body but it actually ACE2 is protecting the lung from more severe injury. So based on this, uh, and, and now again, my conflict of interest, we started this company, basically the idea being uh, like in, 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 in uh, diabetes, there's not enough insulin, therefore you give insulin back. So lung failure, there's not enough ACE2, therefore you give uh, a soluble version of ACE2 back uh, more or less that the SARS virus might have shown us a new medicine for ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome and lung failure, which is actually uh, happening in many diseases from sepsis to the Spanish flu to, to bioterrorism to anthrax uh, to bird flu, you name it. So this is where we were, we even did clinical studies uh, and were laboring away. We were in phase one and phase two clinical trials uh, 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 studying uh, the system and, and dosing and, of course, safety measures. And uh, based on our work and, and from the introduction, so we wrote a lot of reviews on ACE2 and I won prizes on ACE2 as this molecular mechanism of infection. And then, of course, everybody said, so it's beautiful work we did, but who cares? This work on, on SARS infection and ACE2 is totally irrelevant because there's no SARS virus anymore. So, so it was a beautiful basic science work uh, without any implications until, of course, this uh, new virus, the sibling, appeared, uh, SARS-CoV-2, causing... this unprecedented uh, coronavirus-induced uh, disease 2019.
uh, based on the sequence, it became very, very, very rapidly clear that ACE2 must have also an important function. And, and this, this advances in science uh, from nanoparticles to cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, this is actually a structure of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And here in green is uh, 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 ACE2. So this is not our work, but was many people very rapidly showed that spike can also bind to ACE2 from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. <laughs> So the question then was, since we had all this background and, and had been working on the system for 20 years already, and, and as I said, cloned AS2 and developed a soluble version for already being in the clinic, could we use the soluble version to block the SARS-CoV-2 infection? Again, with the idea, if this is, the, is a critical receptor, then this should actually work. Uh, and to remind you again, so SARS-CoV, and, and, and the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, would utilize ACE2, spike binds to ACE2, and this is the signal for the virus to infect the cells. And at the same time, this would actually lead to ACE2 uh, downregulation, internalization uh, inside the cell. The virus does what the virus does, co-ops the machineries uh, of the cells, uh, innate and adaptive immunity get turned on, and of course, many other things happen causing diseases we, we call SARS and COVID-19. <clears throat> and this was the idea of uh, a soluble version of ACE2 acting like a, as a molecular decoy, like a sponge blocking spike to bind to the membrane bound version of ACE2. And of course, by blocking, there would be less virus getting into the cell and there should be improved disease. So mind you, every single vaccine which is in development have been approved actually works on that principle to block make antibodies of course they're also t-cells but to make neutralizing antibodies which bind to spikes so spike cannot bind to ace2 anymore and by doing so can block uh, the infection so nearly all approved medicines uh, for instance the regeneron cocktail uh, donald trump got when he got sick uh, that were based on this principle to block a spike binding to ACE2. So we know this principle is real and has been proven now in basically everybody who has been vaccinated if they develop neutralizing antibody because this is also how we measure this. So, so this uh, molecular principle and, and ACE2 has gone from who cares anyway to probably the most studied uh, molecule uh, human molecule on this planet because of, of COVID-19. So to study this, we hooked up with a group in Sweden uh, to do infections. Uh, this is the virus we worked with, uh, the, from isolated from the first Swedish patient. So we took this virus infected uh, cells, we call Vero E6 cells, it's like the workhorse for, for the virology we do. And then of course, I asked the question if a soluble version of ACE2 could inhibit this infection. Uh, and we published this last year in Cell, and basically uh, we, we could indeed show it, as one would expect if this is important, and reduce the virus load by a factor of 1,000 to 5,000 times. <clears throat> so the other question which was important is, uh, and now we know this is, this is real, but initially uh, COVID was a respiratory disease this involvement from other tissues like the blood vessels and people died of of clotting in blood vessels uh, 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 involvement of the heart uh, of the kidney but but it was more or less uh, secondary so it's a, a respiratory infection but of course we knew that ace2 is not just expressed in in the nose and in the lung uh, cells but it's on the blood vessels it's in the heart so we had published and other people have published many papers uh, it's in the central nervous system. Uh, ACE2 expression changes with age and gender. We mapped it to the X chromosome, uh, being its critical regulator of blood pressure and, and heart function and physiology. Of course, it changes with cardiovascular disease, or diabetes, and smoking. And we also mapped a, ACE2 on the surface uh, of, of gut epithelium here. And there were cases coming out that actually there's a viral RNA in the stool and, and uh, some people develop diarrhea 
and we mapped uh, ACE2 into the proximal tubules in the kidney. So we knew ACE2 was expressed in many of these tissues. <laughs> and so the question was, maybe it's not just a, a respiratory infection, but because ACE2 is expressed in many tissues, it can spill out and of course infect other cells which express ACE2 as its surface receptor. To do this, we, we went into tissue engineering. Uh, this was with Nuria Montserrat. I engineered uh, little human kidneys. Uh, and here in single cell analysis, you can say, tell the very complex different cell types in there. And ACE2 is also expressed exactly at the same place in the proximal tubules where you would see it in humans. And, and in animals. Uh, so we actually made this uh, kidney organoids, uh, sent them to, to Stockholm for infection <clears throat> and with the virus. And indeed, we could infect them and the soluble version of ACE2 could reduce this. Uh, the other tissue I was interested personally was actually blood vessels. Some years ago, we developed this system for out of stem cells to grow perfect human uh, vasculature with with lumen, uh, endothelium, and parasites, and, and basal membrane. And of course, the virus needs to spread uh, somehow, uh, and of course, needs to spread through the blood vessels. So we, we made a vascular organoid, sent them to Stockholm, and indeed, they could be infected. Uh, there's viral progeny, so it's not just infection, but this active infection, creating new virus, and again, in a self-fulfilling experiment, if ACE2 is important as an entry receptor, can be blocked with the soluble version of ACE2. So to bring this all together, of course, there are many other things which, which happen uh, in, in, in COVID-19 <clears throat> and in SARS-CoV-2 infections. Uh, there's ACE2 on the nose, epithelium in, in our throat. This is where the virus lands. <clears throat> and most people might not even realize this. Um, some people get the uh, common cold. And that's about it. If the virus gains access to the lung, uh, ACE2 is expressed in, in very deep lung cells. So this is why COVID patients get this very typical deep pneumonia. Uh, you can even hear it. So this this COVID cough, because of course the places of infection and pneumonia in the lung are different, like from a flu infection. And of course, is there's damage now <clears throat> for pneumonia, there's tissue damage, uh, cells spill in, there's, uh, the virus can be produced, and then the virus would spill out through the blood vessels. I showed you they can be infected, not all of them, but certain some subtypes. And then, of course, can spread in tissues which have ACE2 into the heart, uh, into the kidney, into the liver, into the gut. So ACE2 can uh, explain a lot. <clears throat> the first entry site, the particular way of pneumonia, and of course the spreading in other tissues. So COVID-19 is clearly not just a respiratory disease. It starts there, but in severe cases, it's a multi-organ involvement. And ACE2 uh, can explain some of the distributions of disease. Of course, there are many other things happening, autoimmunity, uh, immune system uh, changes, uh, uh, coagulation changes, and so on. <clears throat> so we also ran a phase two clinical trial with this uh, soluble ACE2. The reason being because it reduces the virus infection, as I showed you, not just from our data, but from data from basically everybody who does this. And secondly, the basic function of ACE2 is actually to protect many organs, the heart, the lung, uh, the kidney, the liver, the vasculature from tissue damage. So uh, the phase two clinical trial is finished. We had actually very few patients. So also something maybe to discuss uh, that the, actually the, the ethics and the dynamics of drug development for COVID-19. So I, honestly, despite all this outpouring, we worked together. This was not optimal what the WHO did. Uh, was also, in my opinion, not really optimal. So this actually blocked a lot of really good drug developments. Uh, <clears throat> so we didn't have enough patience at the end of the day. Uh, we had some tendencies. I think all we learned, uh, not just us, but basically everybody who did these clinical trials with antibodies and so on, <clears throat> is you have to treat as early as possible. And then you see a best effect. Uh, this is now also part of the CONNECTS platform trial in the US, uh, where 
uh, various modulators of the Renin engine tension system, including our ACE2, <coughs> is uh, being tested in, in patients. And of course, there's the issue of, of uh, long term effects of COVID 19. Uh, there's certainly autoimmunity which contributes to this, and we have published on that, and of course, many other people. But ACE2 in its function, of course, could be also a very critical regulator to do this, because if every time we take away ACE2 in our animal models, diseases get worse uh, in multiple tissues. And every time we get more ACE2 into the system, uh, we can alleviate such diseases. So, so it's still unclear what's the mechanisms and, and where the long hauling uh, will lead, but uh, it's, it's, it's clear it, it might become a real problem in the future, and already is. So, so this is where we are now uh, in this world, and, and science has amazingly contributed to rapid uh, vaccine development, uh, amazing RNA technologies and nanoparticle technologies. A naked spike, uh, just to remind the Novavax, just applied for approval. Uh, uh, and, and of course, we started to vaccinate in the pandemic. <clears throat> and exactly it happened what everybody would predict would happen. The virus mutates, as it always does. And of course, has to adapt to local immunity against the virus. So, so variants uh, developed. Uh, uh, it's just normal viral evolution, variants of concern and variants of interest. So I can tell you in Austria now, 15,000 cases a day, <clears throat> I'm probably also in Germany for Austria, I know for sure because one of my former students is now sequencing all the cases. It's 100% Delta <clears throat> variant. So, so the initial variants have more or less uh, uh, disappeared and, and now dominant variants happened. And of course, we have these cocktails of antibodies, uh, but the variants and the hundreds of papers now with this shading of gray on the effects, uh, some of them uh, escape uh, immunity, at least in part, and also some of the antibody cocktails which had been approved uh, uh, don't work anymore because of this escape, as we would expect, and, and there's nothing really unusual about this. So the question then really is, can we develop actually universal pan-SARS-CoV-2 variant therapies? Because these variants occurred, there are many more variants out there. Uh, and because of these evolutionary pressures of vaccination and of course of therapeutics, there will be more variants in the future. <clears throat> so I think we can all agree to this. So, so could we actually develop universal strategies against all the, the variants? And nature actually gave us uh, this strategy already. And this is ACE2, <clears throat> because the virus might mutate to escape a particular specific antibody, but it cannot mutate to escape binding to ACE2. Because if it mutates uh, out of binding of ACE2, then there will be a different disease. Then the only way is it can find another receptor but the disease we call COVID-19 will disappear. So this is a given in evolutionary terms. So, so nature basically gave us an answer to a potential universal therapy. Of course, you can also go for the viral protease or, or blocking like remdesivir does uh, the, the viral replication. But as we know from HIV studies, there might be mutants occur. So is this actually real? And to do this, uh, we, we hooked up actually with, uh, with colleagues at, at the National Cancer Institute, NIH, uh, and uh, tested the alpha and beta variant and the reference strain. So this is the first Wuhan strain, the first Swedish strain we got. Uh, this was from our first paper. APN01 is the soluble version, which is in the clinic of, of ACE2. And in our first paper in cell, we published that around 25 microgram of soluble ACE2 lead to inhibition of the virus by around 40%. <clears throat> if we do the same with beta and alpha, we see this amazing inhibition, uh, <clears throat> which makes sense because if one does actually affinity measurements, uh, then the much higher affinity of the mutants to ACE2. Therefore, ACE2 can actually block beta. So how about the delta variants? Um, 
can we also block this? <clears throat> and these are the data we got uh, uh, three weeks ago. Uh, this is the same as I showed you before. So soluble ACE2 blocks efficiently alpha and beta and delta, even at doses of five microgram here, where we see hardly any inhibition of the reference Wuhan strain. We see nearly 100% inhibition of delta in this cell line and other cell lines. And again, it does make a lot of sense because Delta has shows much higher affinity and also beta alpha to ACE2 and therefore <clears throat> uh, ACE2 becomes a super uh, molecular inhibitor at uh, like super specific and, and super high affinity antibodies to block this. This is 0.1 nanomolar of activity. So that's it's very strong uh, inhibitor activity. So uh, if one proposes this as a universal therapy, then we better know if ACE2 is actually the essential receptor. <clears throat> and, and to my amazement, uh, this was never really addressed. <clears throat> uh, and there are lots of papers in, in major journals in Cell and Science and Nature uh, coming up with candidate uh, second receptors where you don't need ACE2. Uh, for instance, neuropilin one. So the question was really is, uh, is ACE2 actually the, the real receptor or, or could it be just another one? And who cares? We block and actually vaccinate against ACE2, but there could be another entry site and this is what's the real problem. Uh, <clears throat> but it was really difficult to study this. Uh, you know, how do you actually study this in a real respiratory setting? <clears throat> and to do this uh, with Sylvia Knapp at, in Vienna, uh, she developed a, a new mouse adapted SARS-CoV-2 virus. So basically infect the mouse and passage for, for 16 uh, uh, passages. And she actually came up with the virus, which is causing very severe uh, COVID-19 pneumonia in animals and in a particular mouse background, they're all dead after five days. If you give them a high dose of the virus, the body temperature change, body uh, weight changes, this viral load. <clears throat> uh, so all it took is actually, there are two mutations here in spike, which allow now uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike to bind to mouse ACE2, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, a uh, spike of SARS-CoV-2 is not only specific for human, it can infect uh, lions and tiger, tigers and ferrets and many other species, but not mouse or rat. <clears throat> so, but with these two mutations, you can make a very effective virus. And bulb C mice die and actually black six mice get transient severe pneumonia and then recover. So here you can actually see the virus in the lung. So doing this, we could actually finally ask the question, is ACE2 actually critical for a respiratory infection? So we infected our ACE2 knockout mice with the SARS virus, with SARS-CoV-2, <clears throat> and uh, normal mice get the severe infection, they actually die, uh, the temperature changes, body weight changes, it's infection. ACE2 knockout mice have nothing. So now we know ACE2 is also absolutely essential for a respiratory infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So this uh, strain is actually called uh, MAVI-16 for mouse adapted uh, uh, SARS virus in, made in Vienna with 16 passages, if you wondered where the name comes from. So uh, could there be other therapies, uh, universal therapies, of course. There could be, there, and of course we have to look for them. <clears throat> and one of them is uh, spike is heavily glycosylated, as is ACE2. So sugars on the on the protein backbone uh, could and should contribute to the infection. So we we and many others who actually did this now mapped all the sugar residues on spike. So spike has twenty two a glycosylation epitope, which are highly conserved in evolution. And then we cloned actually the largest uh, uh, sugar binding protein library uh, molecules, which are called lectin in the world to probe which one of this protein bi uh, sugar binding glycosylation binding uh, uh, proteins would actually bind to the virus. <laughs> uh, to make it short, we actually came up with two of them. Uh, and other people, as I said, working on this uh, intensively and do amazing research. Uh, one of them is CLEC4G and the other one is CD209. So these are 
mouse lectins and also human lectins, which we proved later to, to bind to this glycosylation epitopes of uh, spike. So this is actually what we do, atomic force microscopy. Uh, here is the spike, and this is how the lectins actually attach. So this actually allows us to look in real time for receptor spike uh, interactions uh, at the single molecule resolution level. <clears throat> and this is actually uh, how it looks. So you can actually see a spike protein dancing <clears throat> with uh, this lectin binding. And we're doing now the same with ACE2 and Delta variants. And actually really interesting looking at the single molecular resolution level. Uh, uh, we can at least in part explain now, but it's work from somebody else. So I shouldn't talk about this in detail, in part explain why Delta became so infectious and how it actually attaches much better to ACE2 and what happens and at this single uh, molecular level. I just love the movie because it's, it's like a molecular dance <clears throat> of a trimeric spike with selectins. So this is how we mapped it exactly. Uh, this is ACE2 and this is CLEC4G. It actually CLEC4G binds to a sugar which is straight at the interface between ACE2 and spike. Uh, CD209 binds to a sugar which is actually on the side of, uh, <clears throat> of spike. Uh, both of them can efficiently block infection. Uh, how binding on the side blocks infection, we don't know, probably some steric hindrance. <clears throat> so to put this all together, uh, the spike in the receptor binding domain and this uh, uh, residue has this, uh, like the arrow of, uh, of uh, 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 Greek god, <clears throat> has this, uh, this very long uh, uh, glycosylation site. And this is actually touching down on ACE2. And this is where this CLEC4 G binds. And we also map that this, this, this is not just protein, protein interactions between spike and ACE2, but also the sugars and this glycosylation site heavily contribute. So one could also target this, of course, because if you target this sugar here, then you can also block uh, <clears throat> a binding of spike to ACE2. And this is really universally conserved and we have not found any mutant of variant or of concern, uh, which actually has lost the sugar. I think we actually did some studies. This probably seems essential to make even spike. So that's why they cannot uh, lose it. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> the problem with the lectins is compared to ACE2 problem is in relative terms is, so ACE2 blocks uh, uh, the infection with, with, with one uh, nanomolarity uh, affinity. And, and then much higher avidity even. <clears throat> uh, this lectins, because of the setup and how they work at the molecular level, uh, you need thousand times more of these lectins to work. So of course one can engineer to improve them. So uh, now I'm telling you fast what we're actually uh, doing with our models. <clears throat> we have mouse models and, and human tissue engineered models. <clears throat> uh, we all know comorbidities contribute to more severe COVID, diabetes, hypertension. <clears throat> so we have started, uh, started now to, to develop actually uh, uh, organoids with comorbidities, with diabetes. So uh, Nuria Montserrat developed this uh, <clears throat> model for diabetic kidney organoids. So, which is really interesting. So oscillatory uh, sugar <clears throat> and indeed if one does this, there's more SARS-CoV-2 infections. So we can model now in vitro in a human engineered kidney, uh, diabetic changes and these diabetic changes allow for more infection of the virus. Uh, <clears throat> so this also allowed us to address the question what I showed you in the mouse, ACE2 is essential. Is ACE2 actually essential? Uh, for infection of this kidney organoid. So we made knockout uh, uh, organoids, and Nuria did in Barcelona. Here are four different clones. Uh, Wild-type clones, here is SARS-CoV-2 infection. They can get infected effect efficiently, and when ACE2 is knocked out, there's zero infection. So ACE2, again, even in the presence of neuropelin and other described candidate receptors, is essential for the virus infection. No ACE2, no infection in this kidney organoids. 
And does this also happen in diabetic conditions? So this is diabetic conditions. Uh, and in, in normal organoids, there's infection. Here's the NP from the virus, nuclear protein, so, so productive infection. And if ACE2 is knocked out, there is nothing. I should also mention uh, the similar data in, in gastric organoids, uh, which, which Nuria did, and, and it's not published yet. And there were two other papers, a group from Arizona, they knocked out ACE2 in cardiomyocytes uh, derived from, from uh, stem cells, no infection, and Hans Klevers group knocked out ACE2 in gut organoids, which can also be infected, no ACE2, no infection. So I think we are reasonably confident now in using human engineered tissues from stem cells and also mouse models that ACE2, again, is the absolute essential receptor. Uh, and can we, of course, test uh, therapeutics using our new mouse model? After all, uh, to test ther therapeutics in, in organoids or, or human cells is great, but uh, the dynamics of a real infection one cannot really use. And the mouse models people have been using are very artificial because uh, the most model people use is overexpression of human ACE2, but in tissues where, which you normally never see ACE2 expression of this mice die of massive uh, brain inflammation and virus explosion in the brain because they overexpress ACE2 in neurons. So, and, and so we believe, and of course, the other models, uh, not just us, that we need to generate better models to study this. And of course, our mouse adapted virus allowed us to do this. So, and to get back to this universal therapies, we, could we actually block the infection if we have a, a, a inhalation of ACE2? Uh, so the mice got infected and then they got intranasal recombinant mouse uh, soluble ACE2 because this virus binds actually to to mouse ACE2, and we could totally block the infection. Uh, and the, the longer you wait after the first infection, the less protection you get. So it makes total sense, uh, this interplay. You have to treat early, even with uh, uh, respiratory intervention. And of course, we wanted to know if this could also work with the drug, which is in clinical development. Uh, and this virus, which is mouse adapted, still binds to human ACE2. So we could actually this uh, clinical grade uh, recombinant human ACE2, we could use infected the mice, uh, got the mice got the intra uh, respiratory infection, and then they got uh, uh, ACE2 intranasal to block uh, the virus. And again, we saw total protection doing this early enough and total protection from death. <clears throat> Uh, of course, other people uh, do this with antibodies. Uh, uh, and again, and this is my last slide. <clears throat> Based on the molecular principle that ACE2 is the essential receptor for the SARS CoV 2 virus, which is the principle where all our vaccines are based on, at least to block this interaction. And the dynamics of viral evolution. <clears throat> uh, in this context that we are vaccinating the globe now uh, against this, there will be variants, but none of the variants can escape ACE2 binding. So based on all of this information from our lab and of course hundreds of other laboratories where this is always the same and reproducible and, and this is basically the heart of the pandemic of the virus infecting us, uh, we believe it's possible to <clears throat> develop a, a universal pan-COVID and pan-SARS-CoV-2 infection therapeutics. Uh, and we have learned we have to do this as fast as possible. The earlier you go, the better. So this is also experience from antibody uh, studies, also from the new uh, drugs which are out there from Merck uh, and, and Pfizer blocking other pathways after the virus uh, infected and actually believe this principle should and must be combined learning from HIV infection, blocking entry, blocking something inside the cells. But if you go early in treatment, of course, you have to have a treatment which is feasible, which can be used in millions of people 
uh, can be used uh, uh, in 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 com in Africa in other places <clears throat> uh, and and more or less the treatments we have now and this is IV the antibodies intravenous one needs to develop a, a form of application which can be done fast is cheap and can be used in 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 lots of people. So that's why we're actually developing this inhalable form uh, of ACE2. And this is now in phase one clinical trials uh, in Europe. So in doc studies, we showed it, uh, it, it on toxicity. So this is now, uh, so we're actually being sent back from the system uh, on drug development to do phase one again. <clears throat> also, we have already this data, at least for intravenous infection. So I can actually understand who knows uh, what this might do in, 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 you know, if you inhale ACE2, if there's an allergic reaction and so on. So, and big thank you to our colleagues at uh, NIH and NIAID who are helping us to, to set this up. Robert Jumek, Ian Krosi and Michael Holbrook, uh, who helped us to develop this. And, and of course, we hope now that this can proceed uh, very fast. Uh, here I, I could make, because it's the ASIC seminar, uh, I, I think what, what has happened and, and, and what one has to consider very carefully is now we have these vaccines. Uh, but as we all know, the, these vaccines, the vaccinate against the virus getting into the blood and of course protect against severe disease, but they don't protect uh, against the uh, infection, or at least not efficiently in, in in the respiratory system. <clears throat> so we need better vaccines. But of course, now vaccines are approved. How do you actually develop a better vaccine in the scenario where other vaccines are approved? So is this ethically even possible? Uh, can we do this? Should we do this? But uh, the same for our ACE2. Uh, <clears throat> how can we actually test this? Uh, if already the antibodies there, uh, Merck and Pfizer got approval, do we actually even need this? Uh, I, I strongly believe uh, we need this. Of course, I'm biased uh, having discovered the system in the first place, but still, do we really need this? And if we need this, if we have a consensus we need this, how can we actually develop this effectively? <clears throat> and I'm saying this because uh, I learned this the hard way. Every drug which has been approved or is in development in life state, late stage development is from the big boys. So not a single small biotech has, has managed to, to actually be on this map. And there are many reasons for this. And, and one of the reasons is, is just to have the manpower and all the money. Uh, and so the question really is for, for systems like this in a pandemic like this. So what's actually the role of government uh, to and WHO to step in and, and say, we want to develop other promising drug candidates uh, because they're so important and we're actually financing this. So, so to be frank, uh, we are very delayed with our development because we just cannot find the money to do it. And I really don't understand it because I hope you, you agree with me, this makes complete sense. <clears throat> and despite making complete sense, we still cannot find enough money to actually move ahead at the speed which would be necessary. But that's, I'm um, happy to discuss this. <clears throat> and with this, uh, I, I end uh, and thank the people who did the work. So Mike Rakow, who cloned ACE2 in my lab again, we were not the first publishing the sequence. We made the first knockout mice. We, uh, we had the sequence in our computers, but we wanted to know the function, but all the credit to the others. Uh, Yumiko uh, KGR developed this intensive care units where we could define the function in lung failure, and of course, show it's the central receptor in vivo for the SARS virus. Nuria Ali, Vanessa is our team, and many more, uh, which use tissue engineering to, to study SARS CoV 2 infections. <clears throat> of course, many, many people do this now with very sophisticated models. Uh, Alex Sufali is the clinician we work with. It's always good to, <clears throat> to know what we actually do, what's the real clinical issue. Uh, for what reason we're actually doing all of this. So he allowed me actually to go to the intensive care unit uh, for, for COVID patients, which was 
the real eye opener uh, to see this, not just being theoretic and do all these models, but actually see the real patients. Uh, uh, Stefan and David did the lectin work. Uh, again, the conflict of interest, uh, this company is doing the ACE2 studies. Uh, there are actually many other companies who do the same thing, obviously, uh, based on the idea and the data. I think there are at least 10 companies in China now which are developing ACE2 for COVID-19 and, and multiple efforts in the US and other places. <clears throat> and Sylvia and her team developed the mouse adapted virus and the many, many more who helped us. And with this, uh, uh, thank you so much for listening. <clears throat> well, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. We're getting many questions coming in and I'm gonna group, into, group them into different categories of topics. But before I do that, I, I want, I'm curious, um, I was with you at a meeting in Barcelona in early 2020 when it looked like you were getting the first idea that, that, that ACE2 was a major player for the COVID-19 virus. And I remember at that time, it was a very exciting time. You were, you were keen to get in contact with the WHO. Can you tell me a little bit about like what happened there? Like, so did you contact them? Were they receptive? What, take me through that period in early 2020. Uh, we contacted them, they were not receptive, they didn't even write back to us. <clears throat> uh, I think the first priority was to repurpose drugs, uh, <clears throat> which were already out there. This is where the whole hydro hydroxychloroquine uh, chloroquine stuff came from, uh, even mectin. Uh, <clears throat> so they were not responsive whatsoever. That's our yeah. experience. Okay. Um, well, then let me turn to some questions. We have we have several questions that are kind of a little bit more about some of the logistics and some of the little more technical angles. So I want to address some of those first, and then we'll get into some of the, the, the broader ethical issues. Um, so some people were wondering, um, could you just explain a little bit more why you think COVID-19 affects different people differently? I mean, is it because they're different people express different levels of ACE2, you know, so like younger people versus elderly. You've touched a little bit on people who have comorbidities, but what's fascinating about your talk is you're explaining some underlying mechanisms that kind of start to make sense of what we've been hearing about the disease experience and the different interventions of people have tried. So could you speak a little bit about the variability of people's, you know, kind of infections? Uh, yes, so the, the data out there that, for instance, children have less ACE2 expression in the throats and the nose, which might be one of the reasons why in the first waves they were not much infected. <clears throat> Probably with Delta, we see lots of infections in kids uh, <clears throat> because you need much less virus particles to get infections, so you can uh, have less ACE2. Uh, so, so this makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's this gender differences being on the X uh, chromosome. Of course, you know, why then one kid gets sick and the other one not? Uh, and of course, for, for, for adults too. I think there's still a, a the million dollar question out there. And of course, for the clinicians, this is critical. How do you stratify somebody who might get more sick compared to somebody else? For the whole system, this is essential. Uh, actually, what I found really interesting, people mapped uh, on, on human chromosomes some, some, uh, some susceptibility loci, get the more severe, less severe. And, and one of the genes that was just identified last week, published in, in Nature Genetics from the British group. So it turns out that it might be actually a regulator of recycling of ACE2. <clears throat> so this was actually not the locus. So it's clearly to control severity of disease, but it's everybody expected it's an immune regulator, but it's probably a regulator of ACE2 expression, which is really interesting. Great. Right. Another question. Do you, what will the effect of soluble ACE2 be between vaccinated and non-vaccinated people? Is there a difference? Uh, we don't know. <clears throat> we don't know. Uh, we are actually I'm on some expert committees about vaccination. Uh, you know, there's some cases, luckily not so many, of myocarditis happening. Uh, uh, and the more spike you express, uh, the more myocarditis cases you see in mostly young males. Uh, so Moderna having the most because of uh, just they have the highest expression of the spike. <clears throat> uh, if this is somehow related to actually spike binding to ACE2 and deregulating some system, we don't know. That's a very important question. Yeah. Um, great. So another question from Rebecca Coffey. Uh, this is incredible work. 
I'm interested in whether we have been able to see the effects of soluble ACE2 after a period of time in terms of the required balance and function of these receptors in the body. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the data that uh, ACE2 gets shed in a real infection, so the, you see actually uh, soluble ACE2. Uh, how this relates to disease uh, really yeah, we don't know. We just know membrane-bound ACE2 is the critical receptor that protects tissues. And if we do a lot of soluble ACE2, we can also protect the tissues. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Let's see how this relates. So, so you, answer better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you made an analogy. That was a very interesting one between like insulin for diabetes and soluble ACE2. Uh, mm -hmm. can, is there a point where too much soluble ACE2 becomes bad for you, like too much insulin will be bad for you? Like, how would you know what the, what the tolerable dose would be? Uh, yeah, we, we did actually the study. I mean, one worry, of course, was, you know, if we do soluble ACE2 regulating blood pressure, you know, people would actually drop uh, because of blood pressure changes. So, so that's why we did the phase one. To our amazement, we didn't see anything. And also now in the clinical studies, the safety profile, the blood pressure profile, and so was actually really acceptable and reasonable. So, uh, so and we like, really went up to high doses of ACE2. So we don't obviously if we overdo it there might be something but we have not seen much at least at the dose we used for the clinical trials uh, just a couple more technical questions how do you administer soluble ACE2 in a targeted way so uh, for the phase 2b trial we did it intravenous uh, twice a day because the half-life is around 12 hours so for seven days uh, again, you know, we have, we have not published the paper yet, but the data, we see tendencies for improvement, but uh, we did not reach the primary endpoint, you know, uh, because we didn't have enough patients. And I think we just, like all the antibody studies people did, we were just too late. We need to go earlier. And then we also realized, actually, I talked to the CEO of Roche, who, is a, who I know quite well, and he said, we know antibodies work if you use them as early as possible, but people really don't use them because of intravenous uh, application, <clears throat> right? Now you have a meeting with 200 people, somebody is uh, coughing at everybody, so what do you actually do then? So now you can, of course, send 200 people for IV infusions, uh, which might work at Boston at Harvard Medical School, but in normal life somewhere else might not work, but maybe in inhalable form could work because it's much easier applicable that that's why we do this and of course others are going for this direction so if one goes early you need a form which is uh, easy applicable and, and feasible to actually use inhalation uh, oral pills for Pfizer and Mercadon. Mm -hmm. um, okay uh, so let's go to some questions now that are a little bit more social we'll, we'll start with um, with your lab so this is a question mm -hmm. from Kelsey Berry um, how has a sudden global interest in ACE2 in light of COVID-19 impacted your lab's research portfolio? For example, has there been a dislocation of your other research efforts in response and or novel competition for grants, funding, or other streams of research that have made it more difficult to plan and execute your work? How do you think about situating your work in this very active area? Uh, yeah, it actually made it more difficult for many other projects. I mean, I'm running the largest life sciences institute at the Canadian University here in Vancouver. We had to shut down the institute, you know, minimal work in many other places, of course, had the same experience. Uh, some places told me they had to actually uh, uh, kill mice they had been working on for years. <clears throat> so this had a massive impact for many people on the basic research. I mean, here we have people who do uh, for many years, for 20 years, they went out to the ocean, you know, to sam make samples and they were not allowed to go there anymore. So, so long-term research projects were disrupted. <clears throat> and of course, because of this, uh, and the whole funding went into COVID, uh, it seemed to me, at least everybody on the planet, all of a sudden did COVID-19 studies. <laughs> and so this became ultra competitive. And, you know, for us, we had been working and laboring away for years and had our first paper. And then we were basically completely blown out of the water by 
you know, labs with 50 postdocs and everybody doing the same thing. And so we, we you know, and I'm reasonably competitive, but we had just, we, we just were totally blown out of the water and we're not, could not compete anymore. And of course, now also people who work on stem cells, we all know now the supply chains have changed. Matricial. So we had to stop now lots of our experiments because this global supply chains from pipette tips to, to matricial, uh, you probably all have the experience to work on stem cells. Uh, uh, you know, we have to wait for months. And <clears throat> yes, this was a massive disruption. And one thing I always did here to, to give messages to everybody working in the Institute that all research is important not just in the short term, we all have to work on COVID because of course the lots of other research which has critical importance and we should not forget about this. So we try to make sure that everybody got the message that they're not left behind to work on, on worms or, or drosophila and but that it's also, yeah. And, and yeah, and, and, and I, don't, I don't know if I should say this. One reason why we actually made this uh, mouse adapted virus so the mouse adapted viruses people did this so i wrote to these people in the us and they didn't give me the virus we didn't even uh, get the response so they just use it for themselves <clears throat> and so you know there was also this whole public notion we all work together for the greater good it did not really happen at least at some level Let me follow up on some of this. This is really interesting. Uh, so another question, what does responsible research and publication practice look like in the context of this kind of heightened desperation and demand for knowledge? Um, can you talk about you know, a little bit more about the, the, what you think are responsible research and publication practices in light of some of the things you've said about people like not really wanting to share resources? Yeah, it's not even this. It became like a gold rush, right? <laughs> Every journal, uh, you know, preliminary data were published in some of the top journals and, and you know, without doing right controls. I, I can tell you in, in one of the top journals to publish this study, uh, that low dose of soluble ACE2 enhances infections. Nobody can reproduce this. Uh, you know, we wrote to the journal and they're not really willing to take this out from the literature. So, so I think there's, there's a very complex answer at, at various levels from the gold rush mentality and lots of people jumping in and doing fast experiments with, you know, without knowing the systems and coming up with all these grand ideas because, you know, if you publish in a journal, you need to have something novel. So, you know, the, the, you know if you do actually solid work and say, this is the key, and we knew it 20 years ago that nobody cares. So, you, you know, this dynamics of everything needs to be new. I mean, seriously, how much can be really new? Uh, I mean, at the end of the day. <clears throat> and so I think there are lots of papers published which should never have been published. And now somehow the journals are very hesitant to, to take this out of the literature. I mean, for ACE2, I know, because I followed lots of papers on, you know, ACE2 is so much ACE2 here, and the next paper is it's not there. And then you realize, you know, they use different antibodies and different reagents. And, but as soon as you mentioned ACE2, and it's different from what people published, you had a good paper. So yes, this was anyway, but this was the dynamics which happened. <clears throat> Right, but you did talk in your presentation about your collaborations you had with Nuria Montserrat and other people on the organoid front. Um, so you have actually have been successful in forming collaborations and moving the work forward. How did those collaborations, you know, um, start? And um, uh, yeah, speak more to that. I mean, so on the one hand, you said that things are competitive and 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 people don't want to share, but you actually have been pretty successful in the last year of. Forming and, and you know, I don't just want to say the negative. There are lots of people who bonded together and worked with each other. And <clears throat> so the whole thing happened. I was actually in a meeting in Barcelona, and and <clears throat> then the sequence of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus came out, and then I realized immediately ACE2 must be involved. And and then I thought we let's use tissue engineer tissues to study this and. And actually this moment, Nuria, who I didn't know was giving a lecture on kidney organoids, so I ran up to her after the lecture and said, why don't we 
combined forces, <clears throat> lowering ACE2 must be expressed in the kidney organoids. And, and she smiled at me and said, let's go. And so they're also very good other examples. And with the group in Stockholm, we had been working and collaborating for a long time. And so the, you know, I called them and within two hours, we had our consortium together and everybody was really open and shared things. And so, yes, that worked really well. I'm very pleased. So sorry, I didn't want to be totally negative. And I'm sure there are many, many other examples of, of you know, the people successfully working together. Sure. Um, so before we move on to other questions about um, pricing uh, and also funding for the research, so a few more technical questions came in. Um, so how would you localize the delivery of soluble ACE2 for um, you know, lung delivery? Would it be through the nose or mouth? Um, so initially you talked about you know, treating people with, with acute lung failure. So oh, for the acute lung failure, we actually uh, initially tried IV. So this is how we developed it. So the phase one and phase two trials were IV. Uh, <clears throat> now we really want to go for, for inhalation studies, so which was uh, aerosolized. So it's actually uh, aerosols in, at the size which go deep down into the lung, because one could also design aerosols uh, at the particle size which get stuck in the nose and the throat. I think this should be also done. Uh, and really go back with this uh, local application for lung failure indications. So I think this, this has a, a good future beyond at least a future which should be tested based on all the data available beyond COVID for, for many other lung failures. So I just hear, for instance, in, in Germany, a friend of mine runs the, uh, the German, the largest German children hospital. <clears throat> so they don't see many children with COVID-19, but they see the, the stations and intensive care units are full with kids with uh, a respiratory syncytia virus <clears throat> because of the lockdown. But there was one year there were basically no infection and now they're exploding. And in the kids, this causes a very severe pneumonia. And, and who knows, maybe we can also use it for there to block some of the mechanisms of driving more severe lung disease. So, so I think this goes beyond SARS-CoV-2, at least should be tested beyond SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, okay, so a couple more technical questions and then I wanna get into uh, funding and other broader issues. Um, so will soluble ACE2 be potentially useful for other diseases other than SARS and COVID? Uh, yes, as I just pointed out, other respiratory diseases. Uh, and we know from, from hundreds of papers so that ACE2 protects from diabetic nephropathy, uh, cardiovascular damage, uh, a liver, lung fibrosis. <clears throat> and of course, there you need systemic application. So our application for the moment is uh, uh, IV, 12 hours, half-life. So for more chronic disease, I think one should define and develop a form of ACE2, which is more stable, has longer half-life. You can give, I don't, you know, every two weeks as, as an, an injection and then test it. Yes, there's, there's life beyond COVID, yeah. Yeah, so on, on this front then, have you noticed any changes in the half-life on different entry points? Uh, well, the, on, uh, the only entry point we really tested in humans so far is really uh, IV. So now we're in phase one in, in inhalation. So I cannot answer this question. But it would be interesting to see sub Q uh, also, you know, because on, on, on pharmacodynamic analysis, you know, slow release uh, or slow infusion, then you probably need much less protein to have effects and, and longer lasting. So I think there might be ways even to use the current form we have to, to prolong the half-life in vivo. Okay, and one more technical question. Um, would you clarify why a universal therapeutic strategy is preferable to a variety of therapeutic strategies that each address their own dimension of the SARS-CoV-2 infection? Uh, because there will be, as, as we, we know, there are many variants, there will be new variants. Uh, the variants will, and we know this, uh, escape the vaccines, at least in part. They will escape the next antibody cocktail, of course, what will happen from the dynamics, there will be, you know, the Delta vaccine, 
they're already working on this. And of course, the big companies will make the next antibody blocking Delta. <clears throat> and of course, this will also happen. Uh, but I think when the next variant hits, then something like soluble ACE2 makes sense. Basically preparedness for the next variant. Uh, there are also many other coronaviruses out there which have not jumped to humans yet, but can also use ACE2. So the, the strategy could also work. So yes, so this is of course not the only solution, but I think in the whole context of improved vaccines, uh, <clears throat> new antibodies against variants in, in this times of hiatus where we don't have anything, then this could be quite useful because it will mostly always work. Okay, so let's get to broader issues about funding. Um, this is a question from Mayoki Chan. Regarding the ethics of new drug development in a pandemic, if governments or WHO were to help fund development, do you think companies would be willing to give up patents? <laughs> it's an interesting Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. I don't know. I mean, we're seeing it, but what's, what's, you know, what's happening? Probably not. <clears throat> yeah. Just protective of the technologies. You know? Okay, well, well, let's talk more about uh, fair access and pricing. So another question by Kelsey Berry. What kinds of commitments to fair access and pricing would you personally consider important to make in the course of further developing your research into a significant intervention? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, at the moment, I have to be frank, uh, because of production, it's not, our therapy is not cheap. So, you know, this, this to have really wide, wide access, <clears throat> one would actually have to, and we unfortunately never had the opportunity get together with people who can actually produce this in much larger scale, much cheaper to make it more accessible to many, many more people. So I think that's very, very critical. So this is also I learned, you know, you can have the best idea on the planet to heal and treat something, but the production, the accessibility, the pricing will be very important. You know, for rare diseases, of course, you can ask for <clears throat> quite the price for chronic diseases. But for something like this, you know, if we talk about maybe treating people in Indonesia and in Africa and other places, uh, one has to have a reasonable pricing. And I think the only way to do this is that, uh, <clears throat> that government agencies step in to actually support some of this development. There's no, no other way to, mm -hmm. to do this. At, at least I cannot see it. Do you think that there are long-term impacts on the practice of science from this uh, experience with COVID and, and this major upheaval of public health emergency, do you think there are long-term impacts on science? Yes, it will. I mean, first impact is that we know as a community uh, <clears throat> and, and of kindred spirits, so trying to improve things. If we really get together, we can come up with some solutions. Uh, might take, it always takes longer than we think, but I mean, at the end of the day, how fast the developments for COVID and the reaction was spectacular. I mean, spectacular success of science, which is, of course, based on science, which was developed uh, 20, 30 years ago. Actually, my neighbor here at Vancouver is the guy who developed the nanoparticles. He works on this for 40 years. Hardly anybody mentions him. But there would be no vaccine of Moderna and BioNTech without his work 40 years ago. <clears throat> so, so I think also the fundamental sciences will be more appreciated, realizing it's very important you know, to support this because one never knows that this <laughs> might help one day and it's totally ignored, but tomorrow it might be actually very critical. So, and, and, and uh, yeah, I think the positive message is if the the new technologies and the global brain at all levels from basic understanding to translating it in, in companies and to the, to the patients. I think if this global brain and this global knowledge, I think taught us that, you know, if we're really willing and we feel also willing to provide from governments to, to public, to investors uh, enough money, we, uh, 
there's some things we can solve, <clears throat> which we always, always, you know, somebody worked here and uh, somebody else and everybody was competitive. So yeah, yeah, I think we should really fundamentally rethink what we're actually doing. <clears throat> I, I personally think, uh, I don't know if I step people on, on the toes. So, so the business models of NIH granting, public granting, uh, uh, the Canadian CIHR, I think it's it's a broken business model. The modern world doesn't work like this anymore. We should really come up with, you know, a proposing a grant and you get killed and only 10% gets funded and everybody gets frustrated. It's such a waste of energy and brains. And, and <clears throat> so I think we have to come up with really new business models. But here they're, they're kind of developing, uh, I think the MIT review actually jumped the gun announcing this new initiative, uh, I think Altos. On, on, uh, so there's apparently private investors, rich American private investors uh, might be willing to spend billions of dollars to address a particular issue. <clears throat> so let's see. And this of course will change the dynamics of funding research, you know, if more and more of these initiatives happen, they might get out of the hands of traditional governments, what governments uh, support and, and, and push. And I think this is also will be an interesting exercise. You know, who owns knowledge? I mean, but if the American government, the US government supports it, the knowledge will be to a large extent in the public domain. But if private investors do the same, who so actually owns this, to, to what end uh, do we do the research? And so I think this will be really intriguing questions for, for all of us. Joseph, do you try to um, support responsible research in this area by maybe participating in peer review or speaking publicly? You know, do, you, do, you, do you sort of get involved a little bit more in, in trying to change the mindset and how people think about research? Oh, yeah, I always did, and I continue to do. Yeah, I give lots of public lectures to, to exactly do this. And, and after, you know, I, I worked for many years in Austria. When I moved there in 2003, there was actually a, a party running for the federal election, and, the, and one of the headlines was, we want the gene-free Austria. <laughs> which was an interesting headline. Uh, so this is basically what I was facing, you know, and then I went into the public. I said, you know, listen, genetic engineering, there might be some benefits. So just let's think about this. I got death threats. People tried to kick me out from the country and so on. So now, you know, so it was really difficult in this milieu. But now with COVID, I think this has, the playground has completely changed. So this is also a game changer, I feel, also at that level. But everybody now accepts you know, the importance of science, that science can teach us something. And so I think there will, there's a game changer at multiple levels. And of course, also in engagement, because now I think engaging, uh, you reach much more people if you engage. <clears throat> I gave a public lecture, I think at the beginning of COVID, uh, was really funny because most of the things I predicted actually happened and everybody thought I'm a total fool, which is interesting, but it was just, you know, knowledge from the first SARS outbreak. There was no, there was no rocket science, you know, the vision, it was just normal. Uh, but I think this video on YouTube, uh, 150,000 people watched and, You know, there was not 10 years ago, there was no way you would reach people like this. So that's, I, that's, that's really interesting. I got another great question from Kelsey Berry. Um, so Kelsey says, in my work, I have observed small biotech companies evaluating potential funding from government agencies. From a point of concern that if they accept it, they will be bound to prioritize the U.S. in their subsequent distribution strategies. Have you encountered a similar circumstance? Are there promising alternatives that you've identified? Uh, oh my God! You know, national barriers in drug development. <laughs> yes, I mean yes, permanently. Uh, 
you know, and and uh, I mean the the US FDA is great, <clears throat> but also you know having an international perspective to certainly support primarily US drug development. Uh, as a European company, it's very difficult. <clears throat> As a small company, of course, if you're big, then it's fine. <clears throat> so yes, I think there should be ways to do this better. You know, when they run a clinical trial in China, they should accept it also in Europe. Uh, <clears throat> of course, different uh, ethnic populations, and one has to be careful with side effect profiles. But I think there could be much larger global outreach, <clears throat> and this would actually speed up drug development massively. And, and of course, there are different business models uh, in biotech. Uh, I started various biotech companies. You know, in the US, you, if you go also Canada, you know, you're selling your soul to the private investors, which is you know single project. And if your project is dead, then we do something else. So, in Europe, it's most you know we we get mostly first funding from governments. At least you can get going and. And now actually worked with China. <clears throat> we started the biotech in China, which is another question. US China relations. Mm -hmm. I find is totally silly. You know, it, why do we do this? Why do we do biomedical research and drug development, right? To help people. You know, there's no borders for diseases, we know for COVID. So what's this? fighting you know if it's done in china it's bad for I mean, <laughs> and, and i know because i asked some friends in boston to to get involved and to, to first try no way because if you get involved you know we might get ostracized by the u.s government and i hope this is improving but at the end of the day seriously it's about fundamental understanding of disease as a community and finding solutions. I mean, if you develop a drug in China or in, in Nigeria or in Europe or in Boston, I mean, as a patient, I could care less. I think this is where we really get have to get the global community. But they see it all the time. And in China, the business model is yet completely different. Again, they actually give us a lot of money and we still own 90% of the company. So it's the opposite was the what's happened in the US. Uh, of course, no money is free. Let's face this. No money from the government will be free. No money of investors are free. So in that sense, I, I personally, if the US government, if a, a small biotech in Boston and I get money from the US government to run my program, I will take it. Mm -hmm. So one last question for you before we wrap up. Um, what ethical concerns do you have about your research? Like, are there any ethical questions that you think about or that you mull over? Uh, yes, all the time. I, I mean, uh, you know, to quote Dostoevsky's brother Karamazov, uh, every stick has two ends. You know, the stick of benefit and the stick of maybe something else. Uh, and I think it's always, of course, what's what's in the greater public good. And, and let's face it, the technologies which are being developed can be used for other purposes. I was on an advisory board for many years in Europe, and then uh, actually somebody said, oh, CRISPR is great because now we could make a, a partic engineer something which would kill, a, you know, somebody from military could actually kill an ethnic subgroup. <laughs> because it's so specific, you, you right. know. Right. Of course, we know CRISPR is great and the new medicine, and you know, and and so <clears throat> yes, and I mean, but that's really your domain. So I'm, I'm for me, it's a really slippery ice rink because you know the sciences, and you know this, is the pushing ahead. You know, next experiment, next experiment. You know, what's possible? Uh, let's make a, a, you know in vir virology. Let's make a much more infectious virus. Let's reanimate the Spanish flu virus. Uh, you know, and some people say, wait a minute. Uh, you know, if this escapes from the lab, uh, so what do we do then? And of course, the other argument, well, we best to understand the system, which is true. I mean, so that was always my world, you know, push ahead and let's see what's possible. But <clears throat> I think we, we very much have to, to consider the ethnic, ethical <clears throat> implication. For me, I'm a trained medical doctor. So for me, the reason why I do this and use new technologies and, and developed also new technologies is 
you know, because I truly believe there's so much to learn. We're just at the surface of understanding and so much to learn. And, and there's such a need to, you know, as a medical doctor, that's, a, that, that's my core. I want to help people. It might sound pathetic, but, but that's why I do this stuff. And then I think it's okay. Then you can also justify for yourself <clears throat> that one might develop technologies which could be misused and, and to, for this, this vision. I think the same for biotech development. And bio, if you start biotechs, if you go into this to make money, uh, <laughs> that's the wrong approach because it will be so difficult to get this. And there are so many little things which could happen and you invest tens of millions and there's one side effect you didn't anticipate and the whole program is dead. <clears throat> so if you go into this for this vision, you know, I want to make more money, I think that's the wrong business. I think we should always know why we do this, where do we want to go? And for me as a trained doctor, it's, you know, I want to develop drugs from understanding to development uh, to help somebody. <clears throat> End of story. And, and I think that's why I can accept for myself uh, the ethical implications, what this could also mean. Also animal uh, testing, right? What we do, it's not nice. I mean, let's face it, all of us know this. So how do we justify this? So that's why for myself, well, thank you so much for your presentation and your very heartfelt comments during the discussion. I really appreciate your, your knowledge that you shared with us and your honesty. Um, so I want to thank everybody for joining us in this uh, special program today. I also want to thank the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School for sponsoring this consortium series. I want to thank Ashley Troutman for all of her logistical help on this. Please join us next month on December 10th. The topic there is Gene Drives, and that is an event co-sponsored by Aaron Kesselheim's Health Policy Consortia. So we'll see you then on December 10th. Until then, have a great weekend. Thank you for joining us.